It's always cool to see Joe and Elijah do the Josh Allen handshakes. Before they leave. Uh, but what a what a cool thing to see uh, the love between a father and a son, and just that, that bond to have something special and unique, right? It's uh, cool to know that God's that way with us. You know that we come here as individuals, yet as a body, and yet individually, God has a specific desire to touch each and every one of our hearts that are here today. And uh, it's by faith we come. It's by faith we come to see the unseen God with the soul that's unseen within us, with our very being, the essence that controls everything of this tent. We want to know God, amen? That's why we're here. Um, so as we're getting into today's chapter, it's a, it's, a, it's a continuation of this precept that Paul's been trying to hit home, and now it's coming to a culmination, it's coming to a head, if you will, and, and with his desire to get the church back to the love that they first found when they found the Lord. And what was this love, as my brother just said, that agape, unconditional, unmerited, unfavored love that comes to us despite us. We, despite all of our frailties, our weaknesses, and even our desire to be an enemy of God, he's become the olive branch. He sent his son to reach out his hand to grab hold of us right where we're at and say, be my friend. Come. Come in. And, and what an incredible thing is we think of so many people that hurt us. So many people that do so many things to us in this world. It's filled with chaos. It's filled with sin. It's filled with bitterness and anger and resentment. And, and we see wars coming of this. We see people who lust within themselves to get what they want when they want it. And what always comes from that is division. And yet we did this. We did this against God. And yet he is the one, almighty God, who created us, is the one who bent his knee. And, and this is such a critical part of the gospel, the good news that's been given to each and every one of us. And yet we know that there are always these people who come in trying to put their, their foot back into the earning this love. Something that they feel <coughs> they can do to achieve something from God. As though we have something of worth to give to God other than our heart. There is nothing that we have that he has not given us. Not one single thing. And Paul's really trying to hit this home. And as we enter into the, to the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, if you could go ahead and Turn in your Bibles there. We're going to be going through the first 12 verses of this chapter. It's a very good thing. I'd rather do a, do a survey of the whole chapter so you can get a feel of the true essence of this liberty that we have. But right now, we're going to focus on the liberty of what God has given us. And as we closed out the chapter 4, we talked about the promise children versus the bond children. Those that were Ishmael and those of Isaac, if you will. Those that were of possibility through men, which became impossible. And those that were impossible that became possible through the work of God. And so we are the second. Amen? We are the ones that have not done anything in and of ourselves to obtain the mercies and graces of God. It's a gift from God. This is what's been given to you by God Almighty through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I've entitled today's message, Have You Fallen From This Grace? What is it that stops you from having true grace? In other words, unmerited favor. What is it that's caused you to go back to try to earn this right? Or think that you could purchase this somehow? What is it about you, or who is it that's beguiled you? Who is it that somehow fooled you and deceived you and deceived you and lied to you to say that you need to go back to something? It's, it's, it's the biggest lie that can ever creep into a Christian's heart. Is that somehow now that you're a Christian, you must mature into your earning of the right of salvation. There's a difference between a sanctification and a growing as a man and a woman. Amen? Versus me earning my salvation with God. So Paul begins in verse 1 of Galatians, chapter 5. Stand fast thereof in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. There's a lot packed into that scripture verse right there. But that word stand fast, many of you military people understand this. It's stand fast, right? When you're waiting, waiting for somebody to give you an order. You're not, you're not at ease. This is another command. The command to be at ease means rest. No, we are in a rest, but we're in a rest of ready state. 
We're in a rest to let the Lord have his will and let his orders be done in and through us. We're in a rest, but we're at a ready. We are ready. The Lord tells us each to be found ready when the Lord comes back. The Lord says, I make you watchmen. I make you people who are at the gate watching for the Lord's return always and ever, but anxiously excited for this return. Not because he's now coming to bring wrath upon us, but wrath upon those who have not received the free gift. Those that have rejected his hand, matter of fact, slapped the hand that's been reached out to them. Matter of fact, broke the olive branch and, and said, I want nothing to do with this God who's met his need for me. This is the wrath that's coming, but we are found ready. We are found watching. We are found resting in so much as we're sitting there trusting in our general, in our Lord. And we renew our strength as we wait, not not with nothing to do, not with nothing, but arm in arm like Roman soldiers, shoulder to shoulder, folding, forcefully, ready, defending the faith which God has given us. God has given us a faith that's, at, that's, that's, that's the devil's at war against. He hates the faith that you're trusting in God. He hates that because he knows as long as your faith and your trust is in the Lord God Almighty, there is absolutely nothing he can do against you. As a matter of fact, the Lord says, if you resist, he will flee. If you resist in faith in God, he will flee. The mighty fallen angel, Satan, will flee. And by the way, the other third of the angels that have fallen with him. And the other men that come against you. And your own intellect, your own thoughts as they're brought into captivity, if you resist. This is what he means by stand fast. Stand fast, stand firm. The phrase stand fast, obviously we already talked about, is not to, not to run or to hold your ground. I used to have this exact scripture verse on a, on a mouse pad in my work office. And it had a, it was really cool, it had a bulldog with a stand fast. And, and I was like, yeah. You know, we all talk about that, but we all start to think of the might and the strength of, of ourselves to do that. You know, the power. This, look at this mighty dog. Look at this man of iron and strength. And yet, it was Gideon who was the, considered the mighty man of valor. This spindly little tiny dude. It was small little David that took on Goliath. Why? Because it was God. It was God who was their strength to stand fast. Not the physical appearance, not your intellect, not any of this stuff, but by faith like little children, to stand fast in the firm faith that God has done it and will do it. This is what he's talking about here. As we continue on in verse 2, it says, uh, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that ye be circumcised, that ye be uh, circumcised, sorry, hold on a second. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor unto the whole law. Christ has become no effect unto you whatsoever of you who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Wow, this is a very powerful thing. This is something, you see, now when we think of circumcision, Circumcision first was introduced back with the, the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, we talked about this a little bit, how we're children of Abraham. We're the, we're the promised children of Abraham, of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And this has only happened because the blood of Christ was shed abroad upon all the world for every sin, for every tribe, for every tongue, for the Gentiles and the Israelites alike, for everybody. And so the, the fulfillment of this promise of, uh, through Isaac would come the Messiah, yes indeed, but more the promise of the children of Abraham based by faith. We went through the book of Hebrews, the, 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 um, the hall of faith, the hall of fame of faith people. And this was a faithful thing. It was counted righteousness under Abraham because he believed. It wasn't because of the circumcision which would then show the world that he was a chosen people, that these were chosen people, and then became a mosaic law as well. <laughs> this law, and this is, this is one of the critical laws. You know, this is one of 613 laws of Moses that people were to hold, to memorize, to adhere to. And, and, and we sit there and we think, well, if I do these things, God will be more happy with me. And this was an outward thing to separate them from the nations of the world. From the people of the world. As a matter of fact, they sometimes tried anyone who wanted to come in to the Jewish nation, they would have to go through this circumcision ritual so that they would be now identified as a different person, a different people. 
Well, the only circumcision that separates us from the world is the circumcision of our heart. But it's not our heart that mattered. It's the circumcision of God's heart. God came down and cut the door, the veil, that was between you and his heart. He literally circumcised himself that you could enter in wholly, freely, to the heart of God. Boldly, the Bible tells us. Because of Christ, who was broken on the cross for your sake. The heart of God was broken for you. This is our identification which separates us from the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ and the circumcision of him. Amen? It's not our circumcision. It's not a work of our flesh and the circumcision of our flesh. We circumcise our flesh now and say, Lord, come in because he first loved us. Amen? We did nothing to deserve that. We, did, we could do nothing to open the heart of God. Only God could open the heart of God. This is the circumcision. This is why he, he takes this specific, this specific law, if you will. Because they were trying to make the Gentiles go get circumcised. And of course, this is a horrendous, very difficult thing to do. And they were saying, this is what we used to do. This is how we invited people in before. This is what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. No, that was the old law along with the 613 others. And by the way, if you think you're just in doing this one, you must be just in all of them. Is that a fact or what? Think about it. We have many laws in this country. If I go and I'm driving down the road 200 miles an hour and I get pulled over and the, and the police officer said, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, well, I was kind of going a little fast. No, you were going really, really fast. But I'm a good man. I show up to work on time, I do, I do uh, mow my lawn, I don't lie to people, I don't kill, I don't murder, I'm not stealing, so I'm good, right? No, you fell short in one. You're guilty and punishable by even one law for its own. Every single one of them is worthy of a penalty. So you want to live by the law, you must live by all the law in order to make yourself righteous or justified. This is what Paul is starting to say here. He said, our righteous invitation was not by man's promise to open the flesh blood, but Jesus' flesh blood, that gate. He tore the veil and opened the birth canal, if you will, to enter into God as children. Think of it that way. Think of it that way. Remember when Egypt was being pulled, I'm sorry, uh, when Israel was being pulled out of Egypt in bondage and slavery. It took the holy working of God Almighty to open up the canal. Amen? For them to be able to come out. And then also when they went to come back in through the Jordan, what did they have to do? Another miraculous opening of the canal so that they could come into the promised land. Birthing is a miracle of God. It absolutely is. And in order to be birthed into God, he must have opened up the canal for you to come in. This is it. This is what he's done. This is what Paul's trying to get to the heart of the matter again. Salvation was never and could never be based on the workings or sacrifices of men. It was always going to be and is the working of Jesus Christ on that cross. What separated us from the world is not the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, but the covenant of love, mercies, and grace, and freedom given to you by God Almighty as a gift. It's our belief in the workings of Jesus Christ. Period. Keeping, the mo keeping most of the law does not free you from falling short of all the other laws as we just said. There's no way. So the problem with this is that sometimes we start to pick and choose. One we think is more important than another one. And therefore, I'll keep these ones, but I'll miss these ones. And, I'll, and my good outweighs my bad. There's many religions out there that believe this. right? As long as I do more good than I do bad, I'm good to go. No, you've fallen short of the glory of God. Period. Period. And we start to puff ourselves up in this. You'll see arrogancy come with this mentality. You'll see a haughtiness come with this mentality. A piousness to come judging those around us. Because I'm not so-and-so. Thank God I'm not like this tax collector. Thank God I'm not like this prostitute. Thank God I'm not like that drunkard. Amen? This is the mentality. And the only way that comes in is when you come back to your old way of thinking. Your own way of, I'm not good enough, but I'm not bad, bad enough to be condemned. No. Every one of us falls short of the glory of God. Every one of us is worthy of the penalty. We cannot fall short of any. 
If you've fallen from grace, you've fallen from grace, you've fallen from grace, does that sting when you hear it? When I read that, it penetrated my heart. Tears came to my eyes. It's a horrible thing to hear. You've fallen from grace. Did you ever see somebody who's fallen from grace from their family? You, this is it. It's the last straw. The last and the door's been slammed in your face. Don't come back. You're not welcome here anymore. You've hurt me. This is falling from grace. There is no more favor for you. I will not open the door to you. And it's a sad thing when somebody goes into that position. And, and sometimes it may be rightful, right? Someone's stealing continually, doing all these horrible things. But then you say you're not welcome here anymore. But, but has that ever happened to you? Where you've fallen from grace, the grace of others. Sometimes it may be in high school. One minute you're the cool dude. You're doing everything. And, yeah, man. And then you do that one thing that you didn't know was the taboo to the rest of the kids. And all of a sudden, you're on the outside. It's like, wait a minute. I thought I was in the circle of trust. No, you're out of the circle of trust. And matter of fact, you're a nerd. Get out of here. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. Where everybody says, wait a minute. I thought it was the cool nerd. No, you've fallen from grace. Get out of here. See, with the Lord, there is no way to come through the door that he's opened other than through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one door. There's one gate beautiful. There's one heart to come through, to come in. You cannot be like a thief coming around the sides and, 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 and try to con your way in. The rules are the rules. It's quite that simple. And the house rules rule. They're God's rules. And they're beautiful rules. And the beautiful rule is, and this is why it's a beautiful rule, because you could never obtain to it and you'll go crazy up trying to obtain to it. You'll go crazy trying to find a key that you can't have other than Jesus Christ. You will feel condemned. You will feel beaten down. You will be a Christian who's not satisfied, not happy. Always come and sit, kneel, stand, sit, kneel, stand, like little robots. And then as soon as one thing falls, your whole world will crumble. Your whole faith as a child will crumble. You will be like that poor little child that has an abusive parent. That when they do that one thing, they just look and they see that the parent has fought. The grace has fallen. It's one thing to be angry, but it's another thing to reject your child. And think about that pain in that poor child's heart. Aren't you just supposed to love me because you're my mom and dad? You know, the face only a mother could love. Nothing hurts that child more. There's so much abuse going on in this world. So much lack of grace. So much lack of empathy. So much lack of getting there and having an open heart. Yes, protect your heart. Yes, guard your heart. But remember the grace in which you've been called and, and put that upon others. If you want to be forgiven, then you must forgive. You must let go. It doesn't mean accept sin, but it certainly means let grace prevail. I had a pastor one time of 30 years, and he was a pastor of 30 years, Mike, for I think 10, 9. And, and he said, if you ever err, always err on the side of grace. And I believe that. I believe if you don't do that, then you're going to stumble in your own walk. If you don't understand what grace is and the fact that every day you're given the grace of God and the breath you have is a gift of God, then you're going to stumble. It happens to all of us, guys. Paul's going to identify with this in a little bit. It happens with every one of us. It pains one deeply to have the door shut in their face, to be kicked out, and yet it is exactly what God does to those who come begging at the entrance of their own merit. Sorry. Door shut painful. Some of you may feel this. Then let go of your works. Come by faith. The definition, the very definition of his grace found in Jesus is mocked and made of zero worth when you come on your own merits. You come and say that Jesus is of no value. The most valuable treasure that God gave was his beloved son to you. And when you come in your own merits, you say it's of nothing. It's of no value to me. Do you see why God would be angry with this? Do you see why there would be the door shut? I come with my whole heart. And you stabbed me in the heart. And said it was no value. I am God. I am in my own righteousness. Let me enter. No, it doesn't work that way. We fall short. Verse 5 continues on and says, 
For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We wait, or stand fast, by the Spirit in faith, knowing the status with Christ alone is, and certain to hear at the time of the end of the judgment, when we come to the end of this life, no matter what we've been doing, if we've been walking in the spiritual trust of God's sealing of you, He's giving you an engagement ring, a promise. He's giving you the Spirit of God to bind you, one with Him. And in this promise, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, at the end of the trip. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that there's a judgment. Each and every one of us will come to this judgment. We will come before the Creator, the Mighty, the Almighty, either as a son and daughter who've been born into his heart, who he knows intimately, and you know intimately, or as a liar and a thief and a deceiver. And you know we talked about this last week. Lord, Lord, I never knew you, your iniquity depart from me. But I did this, and I did that, and I did this. I never knew you. Verse 25, I'm sorry, chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 21 says, his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in with joy of the Lord. Come in. This is something that's coming, and we receive this completely and utterly by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say? I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a, a, a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. A confident, disciplined mind. I have power to walk in this world with authority of God, with his love that compels me, that will not stop me, that is not tarnished, neither life nor death. Nor, I can go on and on, right? What can separate us from the love of God? Your lack of faith. Period. Your disbelief in God's word. Men, women may not be trustworthy. As a matter of fact, are not trustworthy. We all do our own things, and sometimes we're faithful, sometimes we're not so faithful. This is the problem. But God is ever faithful, and he will even use the unfaithfulness of those around you to show you his faithfulness. Yeah. Praise be to God. Praise be to God, because when I see that, then I say, man, you'll do that with me too. When I fall, I'm not like the dog who's steak, dragon, or better yet, I was going to use the old poop dog example. But let's take it to a deeper example that some of us may relate to even more. The woman caught naked in adultery and drug into the street so that all could see her sins. These wretched, judging people, the Pharisees, who were not fair, you see, as we tell the children, or the Sadducees, who were sad, you see, as we tell the children, drug her into the street hypocritically to expose her sin for all the world to see that she's worthy of death. And yet, from the least, or from the greatest to the least, they dropped their stones and walked away when the Lord exposed their hearts. Amen? They thought they were something. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, the Lord says, you cannot be my disciples. You cannot come to the gates of heaven. There's a greater righteousness. A pure and holy righteousness that only can be given to you by the God of righteousness. Imputed to you. A gift. The Spirit of God is a gift. I promise to send you a helper. Even the Holy Spirit, Jesus said. He binds you. Even your prayers fall short. And what does it say? In your prayers, when you know not what to pray, the Spirit that dwells within you will pray utterances on your behalf. I got gotcha. you. I hear sometimes in prayer, I'm listening to prayer, and it drives me crazy as a pastor, I don't know, but I'm hearing someone pray <coughs> something contrary to God, and totally contrary to faith. And I'm like, oh, you know, Lord, please, help them see that you got this. Help them not limit you. Help them to pray not amiss in their own self, but just to give, and, and here I am carrying this flesh again. Oh, Lord, forgive me. See how quick, see how quick the law can come in. See how quick, when the Lord is judging people based on where they're at in their faith and the measure he's given them, 
They, they're giving what they have. They're not there yet. Give grace. Let, let God work in their hearts. Write it down, and as a pastor, feed them, grow them, teach them. But God hears their prayer. Amen? Because of who? Jesus. Jesus. It's because of the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession on their behalf. Come, little children, as you are. I gotcha. Oh, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for trying to take the reins. Forgive me for trying to do this. Not only in myself. By the way, it always starts with you trying to fix others. It really shows how you feel about yourself with God. Amen? He is always with you. Amen. Well, yes, those who confess their sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of right of those righteous. Uh, verse 6, continue on, and Galatians chapter 5 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avail anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. See, he's not condemning those people who come through tradition and got circumcised. Many people get circumcised today for religious reasons. <clears throat> Some people get circumcised for health reasons. Paul is saying it's irrelevant. It's when you say, I'm coming in underneath the workings of my own flesh, that it becomes a problem. There's nothing wrong with circumcision. That's not the point here. It's a spiritual connotation that, God, that Paul's talking about here. You're bringing yourself back under a work of man versus a work of God. And this is a good example how it encompasses all the law. That's why he's saying that. The only thing that avails to eternal promise with God is that the belief in his love towards us. Love, love, love. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. We all have it memorized, right? How do we forget it so quickly? How do we forget so quickly? With ourselves and with others. How is it we forget so quickly? God gave. We talked about this last week as one of the examples we went through, Isaac and, and Ishmael. And we know God tested Abraham's faith and asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And as he goes to sacrifice Isaac, and he was willing to give all things because he believed in God. God's going to do it. I have full belief in God. So much so he clung to nothing. God didn't want his son. God wanted to know that he trusted him with his son. He knew he was going to raise his son because the, the nation has to come through him. God's going to do something incredible here. And yet, at the end of that, what happened is he's ready to do this. God says, I will make myself a sacrifice. And as he looked off, in the thicket was a ram stuck. By the way, many, many theologians believe this is the exact same area where Jesus Christ later was on the skull of Golgotha where he was sacrificed, Jesus Christ. He literally made himself the sacrifice. Literally. Literally became the lamb led to the slaughter. Literally, God gave his son. We can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. You cannot earn more place with God in love. His love is agape love. It's not eros. It's not phileo. It's not even brotherly love. It's beyond that. It's so much further than that. It is an unconditional, unmerited love that's unwavering and unmovable. It is this rock that we stand on, so when the trials of the world come in and the devils come attacking, we are immovable. We stand firm. This is the love that holds us. Verse 7 goes on and says in Galatians chapter 5, Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? So he goes on here in verse 7 through 12, talking about who is this wretch? Who is this that would dare come in and stumble the children of God? Who is this that would come in and take what has been given to them and deceive them, much like Adam and Eve in the garden? Who is this father of lies? Who is this one who crouches down like a lion seeking whom he may destroy? Who is this that dare come in and taint the love of a child and the love of a father towards a child? Who is it? Verse 8 goes on and says, This persuasion cometh not from him that calleth you. This is not from God who calls you and says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, come, bids you to come. No, this isn't from God. <coughs> a little leaven leaveneth the whole loaf. We know that leaven is a missing of the mark. 
It starts so small, guys. It often starts with a small thought in your own head. Just a thought of doubt. Just a thought of pride. It starts to blind us from the love of God. We think we're something, and you are something. You are a chosen child of God Almighty, who is the defender of you. You are holy because he's, been, he's birthed you into Christ. You are one with Christ, and as Christ is one with the Father, you are one with them. You are amazing, but not amazing on your own merits. No more than any child birthed into this earth can say, I did it! You did nothing. You did nothing to be born into this earth. You've done less to be born into the kingdom of God. It's by his grace. It's by his calling upon you. Paul addresses the offender and the accuser of the brethren, the prince of darkness, and his ministers. Those who follow in his work. Those who bring darkness into light. They see your light and they come and persecute you. Jesus Christ says, in this world you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. And you should expect as a light that there will be darkness that tries to come to extinguish dark, your light. But listen, the Lord tells you not to hide your light. Don't fear the doubts that come into your own head or the doubts that come from others accusing you, falsely accusing you, condemning you. Jesus says, I've come not to condemn the world, but that the world through me shall be saved. It's by the light of the Lamb who's been put into you that you illuminate truth of who God is. What's putting your light out? Why have you fallen from grace? What's stopping you from shining? There, it always comes in, guys, and this is the, this is the alarms. It's always going to be, in the beginning, a Jesus plus doctrine. It's always going to be a Jesus and this. There's going to be the Bible and this extra biblical book. There's going to be, see, it's, it's hard for them to just come say, don't believe in Jesus once you've tasted the love of the Lord. Once you see there's no God who's, who's sacrificed himself for me in this world other than Christ. There's none that makes sense that they've done everything for me. That it's completely God. There's no religion that says it's not a work of man. There's always work of men to better yourself to be born again into a, uh, into a zebra and then to another animal and then to another until you will finally reach the epitome of godhood. No! This is the problem. It's Christ and Christ only. And so they can't get you there. So what do they do? They come in and sow their leaven to say it's Christ plus. It's Christ and. It's Christ in addition to this. No. It's Christ alone in whom we stand. If they can get you to bend a little bit on self, or on the religions of the world, or on the works of sacraments, sacrimonies, and this is what you're, you're leaning on, then they got you. Satan's got you. Because it's no longer the purity of the righteousness of Christ. And therefore, you've made Jesus of nothing to no avail in your life. Matthew said, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourself, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Put it another way, Luke says the same thing in a similar way, but a little bit clearer, I think. Luke chapter 11, verse 52 says, Woe unto you law lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering, you hindered. You bind up the kingdom of heaven. You Take them out of the graces of God with your intellect, with your religions, with your ideologies, with your thinking. When they were coming running freely. Let's close up here. It says, and I have confidence in you through the Lord, in verse 10 of chapter 5 of Galatians. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear the judgment whosoever he shall be. Whoever shall be. I don't know who this man is. This is interesting because the Bible says Mark goes to sow division in the church. But remember, Paul's not a part in this church, so he doesn't understand where this is coming from. He knows where it's coming from, but he doesn't know by what vessel it's coming through. The Bible says there will be tares sown among the weeds. And it says, leave the tares alone so you don't hurt the wheat when you try to tear them up. Don't, don't stumble the little children by rebuking you know, somebody, somebody openly, necessarily, that's, that's playing this game. Instead, teach the truth and shine light, and that will be exposed. Let the Word of God do the work. It's not something we do. Let the Word of God breathe light where it needs to be. 
And by the way, those who sow in this horrible, horrible evil will be persecuted, and, I'm sorry, will be um, condemned with the one who's the father of this, the devil. They will be, like him, thrown in the lake of fire, just as it was created for them, they will be with him, him and his ministers. So don't worry about it. It's God, God's got this. Let's go forward. This is what Paul's saying. May this come against them. And he doesn't pray for them. This is interesting. He doesn't pray, Lord, bless them. No. He never says bless them. He's saying, I hope they get. Because why? This is a severe sin. The Bible talks about those that stumble the little children. Better a millstone be put around your neck and thrown into a lake. There's a special, a special wrath that comes against those that hurt God's children. We strive to protect the children in this church. Because I come from a children church background. 15 years of serving in the children's church. If you don't love those children, like me, I don't want you in there. If you don't put your life down for them, I don't want you there. If you're not there because God's called you to love them, first and foremost, then I don't want you there. We'll get them the word of God in the right spirit through the love of God. Amen? That doesn't mean no discipline, but it does mean always love. Always understanding the grace that's been given to you. Let your words so be seasoned with grace, the Lord says. How much more with the children? We have a problem here, guys, in America. We, and me, I have a problem. Coming from a, a, the childhood I've come from, oftentimes you, you come at people forcefully. You come at people like a soldier. You come at people very, very matter-of-factly, and you forget the spirit you enter into the wrong attitude, the wrong heart. And it's difficult because we're supposed to come in with the word of God, which is like a scalpel, a surgeon that comes in. When have you ever seen a surgeon come in with a machete, right, Craig? They're coming in with a, let's, start, let's sharpen up the sickle and come in. And, 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 or a shat, or a, an axe. No. It's always with some Novocaine, hopefully, <laughs> to stop the pain. Oh, yeah. It's always with a team. Right? Mix, let's make sure we get this right. Do it delicately. Let's cut asunder mar to the marrow of the bones and get to the root of the problem delicately. I can't even do Lord, help, guide my hand. How many surgeons have said this? Good ones anyways, right? Help me. This is how we're to come to one another. This is the grace that God's been given to us. And this is the love that we're supposed to come to teach each other and be with each other in grace always. And it says... And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? He's saying, if I was united with them and their philosophies, I wouldn't be persecuted. They wouldn't hate me. They wouldn't be sending assassins after me wherever I go, trying to kill Paul. Because remember, he was one of them. He was the greatest of one of them. And so he knows their cunningness. He knows their craftiness. He also knows the death that they bring, these Pharisees. He knows exactly their modus operandi. And he knows the opposite is what brings life. And so he's persecuted. And what does it say? Then is, is of no offense, the cross ceases. The Bible says that people are saved through the, through the foolishness. It's not foolishness. But my, men think it's foolishness of the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in their ignorance... They're like, who would lay down? Take what's yours. If you're the king and you have all this power and authority, why would you die for your enemy? Why would you surrender yourself? Because they're foolish in their thinking. They don't understand. He has the authority to call himself up from the grave. He has the authority over life and death. He is God. Don't fear man who judges you here but fear the one who holds your eternity in his hands. He's God. I would, they were even cut off from which trouble you. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having grace. But sometimes I think we have grace. In this world, we're so confused. We seem to give grace to the devil more than we do our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Those who are striving to do that which is right, knowing that their righteousness only comes from God. But by faith, like little children, march on. Little soldiers with their eyes on the prize. 
just seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, pursuing the face of God with all that's in their hearts, striving to enter into the rest of the work that he's doing in them, and trusting completely and utterly in the grace and the love of God. And we come in. And then we give grace to those who are out there being ministers of Satan. Those that are putting the boundaries and the laws that God has not put on the saints. Interesting. Interesting. Have you fallen from grace? We are who we hang out with. Amen? We hang out with the Lord. We will be filled with grace. And no, we will not enter into drunkenness, as we'll learn next week. We will not enter into pornographies and the things that, that once bound us. But we surely will sit down with confidence with those who struggle in those things. We will sit at the table and we will minister to those that need a physician, that desire to be healed at all costs with laying down of our lives for him who's laid down his life for us because we are Christ here on this earth and we are full of the grace of God and we will give all the grace that's necessary to those that need it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercies that are never ending. You say every day they're new. Help us, Father God, never forget the precept of which we've been called. Let us heed the warning you gave in Revelation to never lose our first love. You are our first love. Take us wholly, use us completely, but Lord, let us never, never, ever lose sight of your might and your strength and your, your holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.